Um, so I'm here to talk to you about BitSwap um, because it's, it's not where we need it to be. It's not what we'd hoped it'd be. I'm going to be very honest about that. Uh, the current implementation that I wrote is 14,000 lines of Rust code. Uh, GoBitSwap has about 20,000 lines of Rust, uh, Go code. No Rust code in there. Sorry. Um, so we got to figure out why is this so complicated. And, but before you do that, we should start talking about what is BitSwap. Who here knows what BitSwap is? Anybody? Anybody has an idea what BitSwap is? OK. Let's start with what, what does BitSwap do? What, it, what track is this? This is? Well, data transfers are here. Um, but BitSwap does more than data transfers, it turns out. It also does content discovery. Uh, who here knows what's the difference between data transfers and content discovery? No, 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 all right, all right, one person, cool, cool. I know there are more people here than know. I'm sorry, I know. Anyway, so that data transfer is right, is like, I know this guy has my data, and I'm gonna fetch that data. Con discovery is, hey, who here in this world has my data? So if you go to Google and you ask Google, hey, where do I find the newest, hottest memes, then Google will tell you, and that's how you do your con discovery. But BitSwap can also do that for you. You don't need to ask Google. You can ask BitSwap. So BitSwap is like, hey, if you want, uh, you tell me the blocks I want, you want, and then I'll ask the network for you. And then magically, we also transfer those blocks. Unfortunately, there is, there's, there's a little bit of problems with this. So if you look at what BitSwap actually does today on the network, this is how it looks like. So it sends out. What do we want? We want all the CIDs. So it announces a lot of CIDs. And basically, hey, has anybody got this stuff? And then you get back, uh, hopefully an answer. Then most people will tell you, that I don't have this stuff. Because usually you're asking something for something that nobody has, or like this one guy in the conference next to you on their laptop, but nobody else. right? And so what happens is you get the data, and then immediately send out cancellations to everybody else. So if you write a new implementation, you connect to the BitSwap network, what do you see? You send, give me all the CIDs. You look into your store, and before you've looked into your store, you get a message like, cancel all the CIDs. And that happens about 100 times per second. Great. That's not very cool if you're on your laptop and you're trying to, like, you know, preserve battery, maybe? Is that a thing or still? Um, so that's not great. Uh, the other thing that you might think, um, a lot of these protocols that we talk about are request response oriented, right? I send one request here, I send one request here, I get a response, I don't get a response there, cool. Uh, no, very important to understand, BitSwap is uh, a pub sub protocol. So this means I send out messages to everybody and maybe get some responses, maybe I don't. But that's really unfortunate because as I said, we get 100 messages per second in. I don't know who sent me these messages. Well, I can check, but like, I don't know whether they're in response to. They're probably not in response to anything because I haven't sent out anything yet. Um, but that makes it really hard for any node to manage what they actually want to do on the network. So cool, so some challenges. All right, that's not so bad, right? Bitsworks works, right? IPS, content, data transfer, that, that's a thing that happens, right? Well, unfortunately, if you go on the internet, this is the current state of the art. This is what people will tell you. It's like, waiting for BitSwap to finish, well, they usually say IPFS, but we know that right now BitSwap is the main implementation of data transfer, so maybe BitSwap. But that's not cool. I don't want to leave this meme up. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to get to this state. This is the state we need. We, want, we need to go and be like, on the internet and be like, no, IPFS fetches your stuff. And it's fast, and it actually comes to my laptop when I want it, without burning the internet. Um, so how do we get there? Uh, that's a really hard question. Uh, we need to strap to a rocket. Uh, but building rockets is hard, so what can we do? Uh, the first idea uh, that I'm going to share with you on how we can make, do better is we're going to have to break up. I'm really sorry, guys. Um, we have to break up. And you know what we have to break up? We have to break up content discovery and data transfers, because even the tracks are broken up, right? The organizers of this event understand this. We, we got we to think differently. The talk previously, right, we're talking about methods and indexers and things. So let's see 
what can we do, right? So the first step, right? You want to download something on the internet over IPFS. What do you need to do? You need to figure out who has what I want. So um, where the content is is, is kind of hard. If you talk to anybody who has implemented DHT, it's not the most trivial thing to implement. Uh, the indexers are a cool solution. Um, a lot of nodes on the IPFS network today, unfortunately, have uh, DHT providing turned off, which means if you go to ask the DHT today, you actually don't find anything. You go back to BitSwap. Remember the I send all the ones on the network? That's where you go back to. Um, but I think we're actually not in a bad state here. So thank you to Will Scott and everybody else uh, who worked on indexer nodes. We can actually get a decent amount of information from the indexer nodes from nodes that are very large in the network, right? So we have a peer-to-peer -peer network, and all the peers are equal. Well, we want the peers to be equal, but the peers are not the same, right? My big machine at home is a little bit more capable than my phone or this laptop. And so let's, let's write software that actually acknowledges that. And the indexer nodes are a great thing, right? If you go to Pinata, um, they'll probably need a different solution to host data on, on this network than I need when I publish a meme from my phone, right? That's the thing. Um, and so the indexer nodes are a really good step forward here to allow us to ingest actually large amounts of data and make them available. Um, it's not perfect, right? It's not perfect. It is a federated, more of a much more federated system, but uh, we can get to a pretty good state. Everybody can run an indexer node. We'll just need a way of sharing and distributing where do you find indexer nodes. Maybe that's Google. Nah, not that great, probably of a solution. But hey, we could also use the DHT. We could have a DHT record that says, here is the indexer nodes. Maybe, maybe we have a gossip subchannel. But let's say you have some indexer nodes, right? And so you can ask them for the content. The other thing is, uh, we have the DHT, and hey, Bitswap went into the direction of making a lot of content discovery historically because the DHT didn't work, or it worked really badly for large amounts of data. But very clever people and cool people have worked on the DHT over the last years, and it's actually gotten better. And so we can probably now start publishing at least root hashes. Uh, remember IPFS chunks things into many tiny pieces. All of those have hashes. And there's a root that matches them together. We probably should only put the root on the DHT. Not the whole thing. It it's, saves some bandwidth. Um, but that works pretty good. Uh, the folks at ProBlab, Giannis and co, have been working on new parameters for the DHT, making things a little bit better. And Adin has working, been working on the accelerated DHT client. Pretty cool. Um, that gets us actually in a state where we can start using the DHT, at least for the stuff I want to publish from my laptop. Sweet. All right. let's. Let's say this works. Cool. Uh, we still have the thing like uh, we need to we need to actually do the thing that this track is about, right? This guy comes up, talks about content discovery, and we want to do data transfers. I right hear. All right. So 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 does Bob? Does Bob can did Bob tell us how we do better data transfers? Maybe. Um, so BitSwap is not the only data transfer protocol out there today. There are other people who have clever ideas, um, and some of them are built. Um, Hannah built this thing called GraphSync. Um, but there's a spectrum here, and probably there's, there's stuff on either side of this. This is, not, this is not the whole spectrum, but I think it's important to look at this a little bit. So on one side, we have BitSwap, and BitSwap doesn't understand anything about your data. The only thing that BitSwap understands about your data is, hey, you have a hash, and you have a blob of bytes, and if I hash the blob of bytes, I get that hash. On the other side of the world, you have GraphSync, which tries to understand a lot about your data. It has support for IPLD selectors, so you can explore all your IPLD data um, and then stream them ba the solution back to you. That's pretty cool, but it means now your protocol is pretty complicated, but now your protocol needs to understand a lot about your data. Um, the folks at Fission have been working on something called Car Mirror, uh, which is a little bit towards the middle, where we start thinking about, okay, we're not going to support all IPLD selectors. We're going to support a little bit of uh, less. But we also support, they support something where they send um, just a list of stuff they already have, you know, encoded, not because otherwise that will be large, because they really want to avoid the problem of sending too much data, uh, especially duplicate data, because if data structures, they're deeply linked, and you'll end up with a lot of duplicates otherwise. So I think there's something on the other side where it says cool new protocol um, that is a little bit simpler even than Carmera, and a little bit more complex than BitSwap. Because 
if everything is chunked, remember, everything is chunked into tiny pieces. So we end up having a lot of round tips. Not so cool, because latency is a limiting factor. And hey, what if we send actually something to the moon? You can't, like, that takes time. So um, my current idea, and this is very new. I've talked to some of you about this. Um, this will probably change before everything, any sh thing ships. But this is my plea for, like, we need something else. It looks a little bit like this. So we're going to do requests. I mean, everybody hopefully here has once used the gateway. And if you go to the gateway, you make requests like look at a path, right? And you send this weird hash thing, and then slash my, my cat, and then I get my meme, right? Cool. What if I could send this over BitSwap? Or, you know, cool new protocol. Um, now, this meme is very small. Um, as you've seen, um, the resolution of my memes is not so high, so it'll fit in a, in a single block. That's cool. Now, but I have also a cat documentary that I want to watch, and so that's not going to fit into a single block. And, but I would really like to avoid like, having 18 round trips to fetch the whole video, right? Because I actually want to watch the whole video. So what if I could be a little bit more, say a little bit more about this thing? I'm calling this parameter recursion. It's, it's a stretch on recursion, but the idea is I want, I want this thing, but I also want a little bit more, and that means like expand on the tree structure that is behind this, in this uh, case, for two levels. So OK, we can see these requests, but what are we getting actually back? Is that actually useful? So one big problem that we have if we start doing uh, more blocks, that we request more blocks, is trust, right? So if I send you a hash, you send me a ha blob of bytes back, I hash that blob. I know it's correct, it's wrong. If you're sending me wrong stuff, I stop talking to you. Now, if I, you send me many blocks, I don't want you to send me many blocks before I stop talking to you because you sent me the wrong block. So the idea here is um, we do, so if you look at how the gateway resolves things under hood, if you send a path like this, we do that basically in reverse. So if I send this request, the response should look like and must look like in this protocol. Otherwise, you will abort um, first the, the root block. Now, the root block is going to have some links. Uh, so I get the root block. I look at it. I look at the links. Sweet. This is, this is the right block. There's a link in there which says my, right? So the next block that needs to come is this my. So I can hash that next block. I'm like, OK, my hash matches. Cool. And so I go on until the end. If at any point any block arrives in my world that is not fitting this chain, I can abort. So I don't have to trust the other party except for, like, well, I do have to read the data and check that it verifies. But that's the same thing you have in BitSwap today. Um, now, this is considerably less round trips than you will have in um, BitSwap. Because remember, for like in this, this, this same request, response play in BitSwap today would at least require you to go for each block one round trip, right? Because you get one block, you parse the block, you send the next request, and because BitSwap is very gossipy, it will actually be probably many, many more actual things. So that's the current idea, the current ideas that, that I have there. Um, we need to build a little bit more. It's, it's a purely request response protocol. Um, and um, what's much cooler is that um, I had an idea, is that other people seem to like the idea that we need to move forward and build a better data transfer protocol that helps us. And so it, I'm proud to announce a new working group called Move the Bytes, um, together with Dachau's Fission uh, and Textile. And um, if you're like worrying about data transfer protocols and need to move bytes around, please come talk to us. Please tell us what your data looks like. This is my request for everybody who ever uses this system, is like, send us a message and tell us what actually looks, is, is the data that you're lo lo working on. Because it turns out doing data transfers efficiently, ma it matters a lot what your data is um, and how you move it around. And so you really want to be sure that you can manage these use cases. We don't have all the use cases. So you all have the use cases. So bring them to us. Tell us how you're moving the data around. Um, we're going to work on this. Um, hopefully, we're going to ship something, a prototype, soon. Um, that's, a, that's the goal. Um, Important disclaimer, everything I've shown you, we might throw this out. This is an idea. Uh, but it's to get us talking, to get us moving forward, actually making progress here, such that we can actually move these bytes faster. Um, 
And we're going to measure it, right? We're going to put it on the wire. We're going to see, hey, how is, what's the overhead? Is this actually faster? Is this maybe, maybe the idea is bad and this, it's going to be slower? So we like, need to figure out something else. Um, it's not going to replace BitSwap overnight, right? A lot of people worry about um, how do you actually upgrade to a new data transfer protocol, right? Um, luckily, originally, when we built IPFS, we have protocols in place so we can add many more protocols. We've just heard a talk about how do you add your own protocol. It's not that hard, luckily. Um, and we have nodes. We have Iron nodes, we have Kubo nodes, we have JS IPFS nodes that all speak BitSwap already. Um, so they can bridge the world for a while. So even if old nodes don't upgrade, we can still fetch data. We can still use the gateways to fall back at worst comes to worst. Um, but we can start that new nodes start talking new protocols and then actually talk to each other considerably faster. Um, yeah, thank you.